Happy Friday, everybody. Welcome back to CMask. Joined by Will and Mike, and Tim might be here quite soon. Um, today, we are going to be discussing uh, why somebody might not be getting respect in the home as a patriarch, why they might not be regarded as a leader, um, especially, and, and most interestingly, when they think that they're doing everything right. Um, and I, I sort of operate under the auspices of something that Jordan Peterson once said, not in all ways, because it can be quite dangerous, but in many ways that effectively, if something's not working, you're not correct, right? If you believe that you're the head of the household, but nobody treats you like you're the head of the household, perhaps you're wrong about something. And if you think, well, I'm doing everything correctly, I'm praying, I'm fasting, I'm working out, I'm you know, rosaries and consecrations and this and that and the other thing. And my children don't respect me. My wife doesn't listen to me. You're wrong about something. And so today we're going to be discussing the ways in which you might be wrong about this. And uh, to start with that, I want to go to Mike and ask you, Mike, have you encountered uh, or in what ways have you encountered this sort of phenomenon that I just described? guys who say that they have ostensibly been doing everything correctly and yet they're not seeing the results of respect in their home. I think there's a level of um, delusion with a lot of these guys, if I were to be completely frank, because I think most guys fall into two camps, but the majority in one of two camps. And what I mean is most of these guys are like, well, I pay for everything and I take them to church on Sundays. And then everywhere else is a kind of a question mark. So like the book ends, maybe the beginning and the starting of the week or the beginning and the starting of the day, they're doing everything well. At the end of the month, bills are paid. But in between, uh, they have no concept of, you know, let's say how to hold boundaries or they, or they just don't listen to their wives and they're domineering. But most of the time, it's they're too soft. They don't actually know, know how to properly be the leader of the home. And they're typically hanging their hat on the fact that they provide or the fact that they can provide and protect without you know completely missing the point of you know how to connect with their wife how to be a leader to their wife and how to be the the spiritual head of the home and i think a lot of it you see a lot of spiritual neglect so these guys are saying well i'm doing everything right by their own sort of faulty standards are they doing everything right they're typically just the provider and everywhere else they're kind of soft and a bit lukewarm in my experience, that's the majority of guys. And then a, a smaller percentage of guys are dudes that are, and this has been my experience, even in my own marriage early on. I'm a very choleric person. My wife is the complete opposite of me, where I'll provide, protect, I'm, you know, a strong guy, you know, praise, praise Jesus. But then I completely forget that, like, my wife has these emotional needs that I probably need to meet as well that she needs to be doted on and, and, and treated with, with love, care and affection and tenderness. And I often, or, or I've often neglected that. And then, well, I'm doing everything right, except I'm kind of ignoring my wife in the house. Hmm. Yeah, but most guys fall in that first camp, not that second camp is what I find. Yeah. Well, what do you, what do you say to this phenomenon? Yeah, that's really interesting because Mike's talking about somebody thinking that because he's hyper competent in one important area of being a patriarch, like material providing, that that somehow substitutes for weaknesses in other areas he can turn a blind eye to. And Mike specifically mentioned spiritual leadership. I think that's super common, but I think we can also turn that on its head. And you sometimes see as well, the guy who is really hyper-focused on spirituality, specifically mm his own right and he thinks that all the problems in his marriage are in that order like i go to church and i follow all the teachings all the precepts in fact i impose penances on myself that i'm not strictly required to i pray more than i need to according to what the church advises etc cetera, etc cetera. and he thinks that if he just does more in that area or solve his problems but his real problems are elsewhere. And there's a great line from St. Augustine. The Council of Trent adopted it, I think, because it was so good. And 
it's God does not demand of us impossible things. you got to bear that in mind, right? When God says that you're the head of the household, then it's not impossible to do. So no guy should be blackpilled about this. But by his demands, he means us to do our utmost, to ask for what we cannot do, and he helps us to do it. And the bit I think is really important here is he means us to do our utmost. So if you're just asking God to fix your problems for you, right? Make my wife obey me. Put my household in order. One of the most emasculating things God could do is just make that happen right away without you doing your utmost. Like it's the effort required. It's to focus on your faults, your defects required. That is the very thing that's going to make you grow as a man. Think about if you were raising a son, for example, and he couldn't tie his shoelaces. Dad, I can't tie my laces. And you do it. Whatever problem he has, you just come in, you swoop there, and you fix it. And you steal the struggle away from him. You're going to stunt his development. And guys who think that if their wife is disrespectful, they can just run away and lock themselves in a study or a cupboard and say a rosary. And that's going to fix it all. No, it's not how it works. I think on the Noah episode, um, we I came at what you just said from the Augustine quote a different way, which is that there's no temptation that you'll ever receive that you don't have sufficient graces to overcome. God's not going to tempt you with something that you don't that you can't avoid, right? He's not going to cause you to sin. Um, he's going to give you a challenge that he knows that you can overcome because of the sufficient graces. And I think that's basically just the other side of what you just quoted will in the Augustine thing. Like you're being called to a really, really tough thing. Like you could even argue that it's tougher in, in some regards than the priesthood. Now, obviously the priesthood is, is the highest masculine vocation uh, because of celibacy and the self-sacrifice that comes with that. But just with respect to the office of, and, and getting recognized as a leader, like you don't have a, a costume or an outfit as a patriarch. <laughs> you don't have like a uniform that even police officers, I'm sure you guys have seen the studies. So like if you wear a uniform, people just sort of listen to you more. And it could be as much as like a shiny vest, like just like a reflective vest. And people are like, well, this person knows what they're talking about. Like you don't have that as a dad you are or a husband. Like you have whatever clothes you have and you have to somehow convince everybody um, that they should listen to you. Um, and so, you know, this episode was sort of inspired by what, Will, what you were sort of emphasizing there, this obsession with the spirituality and what, why I find it to be such an interesting topic is because clearly none of us are saying that the spiritual life is something to be abandoned or that it's unimportant or that it's not effective or that it can't aid in you being a better patriarch. Like that's not the premise. But the, some some bit of mystery arises, some paradox arises when you have traditionalists who seemingly are ascetics at this point. They're they're fasting, they're doing cold showers and penances, they're praying multiple rosaries a day, they're doing all these consecrations, and my wife doesn't respect me, my kids don't respect me. It's like, okay, so what are they wrong about? Mike, what do you think they're wrong about if they're supposedly doing the religious aspect correct? Well, I think, <clears throat> I mean, there's, a, I think, a couple things to this. I think on one side, what you see a lot, and I've experienced this with some guys in, with my coaching, is they don't actually involve their families in their prayer life. It's very, like, individual. Mm. These guys mm. are going to adoration on their own. They're doing a lot of their, the, you know, their reading or their praying of the rosary or these certain devotions in isolation of their family, instead of making it, finding a way to involve their family in it. Um, that, and that can be quite disruptive because it's never going to look like, especially when you have small children, it's no, you're never going to sit in a circle with your young kids and have them not shift around and do something. Mm -hmm. So quite often, I think it becomes too inward and not enough getting the family involved in it. And so for an example, how I bring my family in on it is when, you know, we're getting the girls ready for bed and my daughters are doing whatever they're doing. They're not going to sit down and do it. I don't want them to resent the process either. So I'll pray a rosary out loud while they're doing the thing. They're hearing it. They're catching mm -hmm. it. 
My wife is there. We're doing intentions for each of the decades. We're praying. I'm also getting these little children's pr uh, prayer books. We read them before bed. And that's part of my prayer life, my active spiritual life that I'm involving my family into. And I think that's kind of like an underrated way. And I think this is one thing that I would say for sure, Matt Frad got really correct. He said, you know, I used to get really frustrated with my children when I try to do a rosary with them and they wouldn't do it according to my standard. He goes, let them build that fort or play in the background while you do it. It's going to be better for them. And mm. it's a, just a better experience for the family as a whole. I, I, I've seen that. It's really common. I don't know if you guys have yeah. seen it, but I've seen it a lot. It's, it's just a lack of br bring the family in on that collective worship. You're the spiritual head of your home before anything else. Yeah. Well, I, being the guy here without kids, um, I, th I think this is a common phenomenon for like people who don't have kids. They spend time with people who do, and they get like particular about like, why, wait, why are you guys letting this happen? It's very noisy. Like what's going on? Like I can kind of get that way, you know? Yeah. And t Tim sort of does a similar thing with the rosary with his kids as what you just described, Mike. And then will, when I spent time with, with you and your family, like, you know, we went into a different room, we all sat down, we prayed and like, not every person <laughs> in that room was, had like the presence of mind or like the emotional stamina to make it through the prayers that you wanted to do with your family. And you plowed forward. You're like, keep going guys, you know, follow me. That was like the epitome of leadership. Like dad's in the front, he's taking step by step by step. And the family might be, a little chaotic behind him, but they're following right behind him there versus what it sounds like we've been hearing from some of these trad guys is they sort of go off and like self-flagellate like in the Da Vinci code That's and right. think that like by, by their own stripes that this, they're going to heal their family. Will, Will, what do you think about all that? Yeah. I think it's just common sense. Like you're not going to get a one-year-old and a, three-year-old and a four-year-old to sit in perfect peaceful meditation during 15 minutes of prayer. That's crazy. And the worst thing you can do is run away from that reality. You can show them it, which is what we're talking about. You can show them it yourself and have the older members of the family join in as far as they're able to. But just being in a room of the whole family praying, as imperfect as it is because of concentration spans and all the rest of it, that's still really valuable, far better than dad's off somewhere else doing something because he doesn't want to be around us. And it's also an unrealistic standard because how many times when we're praying a rosary, we're not always in the most meditative state. My mind goes off on me. I just have the ability to just sit still in that. How are our kids going to do that? And so, so much of this stuff is, is caught and not taught, you know? And so a, a, a big part of my prayer to my daughters and my family in general is like, I just, God, like give us the graces to show them the love and the joy that comes from obedience so they may never depart from your word. It's not gonna be me bashing them over the head or strangling them with a rosary. It's gonna be how they see us actively worshiping as a collective. And so I also don't expect them to sit still in mass either, but they're aware of what's happening. They can hear it, the smells, the sights, the sounds, that's going to stick with them for, you know, the rest of their lives if we do it well and don't expect them to, you know, sit in stillness, which is just unrealistic. I think that's the most common thing. These guys are just doing their own thing, not paying much mind to their families. Yeah, exactly. And there's a great line that I'm sure Tim will be able to tell us more about in Aquinas when he says that, uh, since therefore grace does not destroy nature, but perfects it. So grace builds on nature. Natural reason should minister to faith as the natural bent of the will ministers to charity. And I think what we're talking about here with this hyper focus on spirituality is basically the neglect of nature and natural reason. That's one extreme that guys can go to. And a lot of the faults in leadership of the family are on that natural level. Tim, we're just talking about why some trads might do all the prayers that they think are necessary, fulfill everything to the T, and yet the family is still disordered. Like, how can this be? And we're discussing how, yes, plenty of things in the supernatural order are correct, but the natural order has been left untended and it gets chaotic. Yeah, we... Uh... I had a friend who would always point that, that this out, the fact that the natural virtues 
discussed in books three through six of the Nicomachean ethics are really the foundation of building the supernatural virtues, faith, hope, mm. and love, and the extra supernatural virtues like prayer and prayerfulness, <clears throat> worshipfulness are built upon those. And if you try to put the, if you subvert the order and put the supernatural below, meaning in front of the natural, then um, the whole structure is going to topple. Right. And that's yeah, what that, you get. Uh, as, as Tim, you answered, and Will, you sort of prefaced that question. I was remembering the critique that Christ had of the Pharisees. And then, because I was thinking, okay, faith versus works, right? Like faith without works is dead. But it's like, but they are doing works. So then why isn't it working? And it's like, well, because they're Pharisaical about it. They're They're mm -hmm. thinking it's the law. It's the ritual. It's the hand washing that that produces holiness, that produces the efficacy, and it's not. Um, which is additionally cool because the only true patriarchy is downstream from Christianity. It's not from Judaism. It's not from Pharisaism. It's also not from Islam, which is achieves it through tyranny. Right? We're just going to abuse and domineer and scare the crap out of everybody until they treat us like we're respectable. Um, True masculinity is like it's real and it's so real that it freaking works. Like you know it by its fruits, it works because it's real through and through. And yeah. uh to that point too, I don't I don't think these guys are exhibiting much joy outside of these things too. So you can see all these prayer habits, mm -hmm. but are you joyful in your home? One thing I really had to learn the hard way, especially when I was leaving the home to go work was I forgot to kind of leave the armor and the work at work and come home and just be joyful and pleasant with my family. Like we really, I, I think we over or we underestimate how much our tone reflects in the home. Like we set the tone for the house. So you could be doing all of these things, but if you're not joyful, loving, over the top, affectionate with your family, like how does, you know, you're doing all the works, but how does your faith actually produce um, fruit in that sense and how you interact with your children or with your wife. I think that's super important as well. Like I want my yeah. kids to see how joyful I am. And it's so funny. Like when well, my wife's in, she's, you know, not feeling the best or my kids are not feeling the best. If I just make an effort, even if I'm faking it to just be happy and joyful and positive, the tides turn and they turn mm -hmm. rather quickly. Mm -hmm. This is what I was telling the masculinity group last night, Mike, you, you heard me say it is the most important thing that you can do to let your family know you love them is to show them and the the two best ways to, i mean aside from i mean that means spending time and most guys just shy shy away from the family falls apart because guys are like what's the minimum amount of time i have to be here um before i can dip out go get a drink go play golf go ride motorcycles go do whatever and i i always took it the other way around. What's the minimum amount of time I can be at work before I had kids. It was like, Oh good. I don't need a fancy job. I can just, I can just teach public school. I don't have to dicker about the amount of time, the amount of money. And then once I got kids, it was the same thing. Okay. Now I have two kids, four kids, six kids. What's the minimum amount of money I can get away with um, making. And um, if you do that in reverse, and you're shorting the family on time. Maybe little kids don't notice it. They just jealously want more of your time and they haven't thought about it much, but teenagers are good at figuring out bullshit and they know. And so again, aside from spending time with them, the ma main way to make a holy family isn't necessarily to make them pray the entire office every day. <laughs> it's, it's to, it's, it's literally to, um, Tell them you love them and show them. And I mean, if I'm in a slightly grouchy mood, you, my family probably realizes this. I don't know if I've ever told them. I'm giving them more hugs when I pass them throughout the day just because I, I want everyone mm. to be happy. and I want a good foundation. Mm. I'll, I'll just give them more pats. It's like an insecure thing. And I'd probably say, I love you. Every time I pass any member of the fam in the hall, I'm not sure you know, I'm not sure what that means, but you're, uh, the point is I'm always just trying to let the, the transmission of love go because yeah. loving your family enough isn't, it, it, it requires a transmission. Yeah. I think that's the best overcompensation parenting mechanism I've ever heard because when, <laughs> no, I'm serious. I'm dead serious. I don't think yeah. it's overcompensation. I think it's an actual like effective no, compensation because yeah. like if you're, 
like I, I remember like if, if my mom wouldn't be in the best mood as a kid, but I heard her whistling, I was like, oh, cool. Like it's like yeah. she's not mad at me or, you know, nothing's like actually super wrong. She might just be having a rough day, cause, but like I heard her whistling. So there was like enough joy in there that it sort of like balanced things. And so I think that's a fantastic mechanism to just scoop out a little bit more affection if like inside you're not doing too hot here. But so we... Tim, I do want to get a bit more of your thoughts on this because before you joined us, I said none of us are saying that the spiritual life is not important or that it can't aid in being a patriarch. But there's such a conundrum here about exercising religious practices and thinking that that's going to translate into being the type of person that's respectable, being the type of person that's well regarded in the home, that's interesting, that's charismatic, all these things. Uh, can you just give give your word on why A does not necessarily fill bucket B? It can help, but it does not mean that it will fill bucket B. Bucket B has to be filled with, like you said, natural virtue or whatever else. Yeah, I mean, I I think it reduces to that first comment I made. Um, sorry, I came in late, all three of you. But um, I think it reduces to that. It's that there is a taxonomy um, of virtue that Aristotle provides it well. St. Thomas fills it out with the supernatural virtues. And the taxonomy is also a chronology. You You have to get the more basic ones first. And it's something that you note when you go to a lot of times the TLM, I mean, I, I did a show on this with Matt Marsden, Pat Coffin, and um, Anthony Abate earlier in the week. People are going to think I'm shitting on the trads. A lot. I, I'm not trying to. I mean, look, this is the only mass I want to go to. I just wish that when I went there, there looked like more, there were more men like you three guys that I actually want to spend time with. Or, or, you know, I mean, there are some, and it's better in some cities than others. I can't figure that one out, but just natural variants. But the point is, it's natural virtue first. When you get natural virtue first, it's not just that the the, um, the supernatural virtues and the supernatural practices can help you. They absolutely will help you get a better, holier family. You can't do it with the natural virtues alone. But what's happening is these guys are all trying to skip the over the natural virtues and get right to the supernatural virtues, and you get neither. You get neither when you try to put them out of order and just, I'll just go to faith, hope, love. Those are like the hardest one. I mean, charity is the hardest virtue to have. And how many times do all of us here on the freaking awful Catholic internet, Catholic Twitter, um, just be charitable. That's the hardest virtue to have. Like no one has that one aside from Jesus himself and the saints as charity plenarily. So it's, I think it's simply them trying to shortchange what they have to do to truly get the virtues, you really, really do have to go in the order that Aristotle tells us, really beginning in book book two of the ethics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Tim, I remember asking you and, and our friend Scott uh, a while ago about something difficult I had to do. It sticks with me to this day. I was like, I have to do this hard thing. I have to have this hard conversation. Like, how do I get fortitude? I was like, I want more fortitude. Clearly, I like, looked at the taxonomy, and I was like, I'm deficient in X. I was like, what's the supplement of, <laughs> of fortitude? And uh, both of you kind of simultaneously quoted Aristotle, like the way you get virtue is by acting virtuously. And I'm wondering if it's sort of a feminacy from these guys where they're they're trying to pray for the thing that they can't get by their own efforts because yeah. they don't want to do their own work. And what you're saying about the natural virtues help facilitate the supernatural virtues. Um of like faith, let's just take faith, for example, like I still every night before bed am like complaining internally before I pray my rosary every night. I've been doing this for how, I don't know how many nights in a row, well over a hundred nights in a row. And I'm like, oh, what do I have to do it tonight? Like maybe I could just, I'll do it. I'll do it while I'm laying down in bed. I won't like kneel beside my bed. And it's not even the rosary itself. It's not like I want to be on the team. So I'm praying the rosary. It's like, I don't want to be a bitch. So I'm praying the rosary. Like I want to yeah. do something every single day so I have some modicum of discipline as a man so that when other hard stuff comes up in my life, I'm like, hey, no matter what, I'm going to do the thing. Will, Remember, do you think 
Go ahead. Sorry, I was just going to say that of the four phases that you move from vice to incontinence to continence to true virtue, the longest phase is always continence. But I guarantee you, you're less continent now than you were six months ago. So just stick with it. I mean, I, and I, I'm that way when I do my rosary too. And I skip rosary daily um, some days, which is bad. So good job even staying continent rather than sliding into incontinence. Sorry, Will. Thanks. Yeah. What was the question, Nick? Uh, I was just going to ask if you think that it's um, a form of effeminacy to pray for the higher virtues instead of working for the natural virtues. Right. Yeah. And it comes back to what we were saying earlier about how God isn't going to steal the struggle from you because the struggle is the thing that you need to purge and transform you. So he'll just let you sit in the difficulty until you've given your utmost because that's what you need to address your weaknesses. The example I gave earlier of a guy who is finding his wife hard to manage, so runs away into his basement and shuts the door and prays a rosary for hours and on end, rather than just having the conversation with her, just as a virtuous pagan would with his wife about how, look, hey, no need to talk in terms of natural law because you're not trying to get books out and have a big <laughs> academic discussion with your wife, but just straightening out the marriage hierarchy as natural law says it should be. You have to correct your wife sometimes. That doesn't mean you run away and pray about it. You just get it done right there and then. Don't overthink it. And right. for some men, Tim's point about, you know, the continent's taking a long time to develop. There's some stuff in the secular literature on developing habits that says like around 18 months is how long it takes for a new habit to really sit in and become well established. Hmm. Maybe that's a good ballpark. I don't know. But you might need to spend 18 months to a couple of years of doing all the stuff with your wife or your teenage kids or whoever in your household that you've been avoiding. So this is a conversation that I've had with, with my fiance many, many, many times. And both of us find it sort of in, um, unclear. There's not a whole lot of conversation on this. I'm very curious about your guys' take on it. Um, of not really obligations for spiritual life, but balancing what does the office of um, parents, husband and wife look like with respect to the spiritual life versus an ascetic or a, a religious person. And, you know, there's, there was some debate about like, well, you should pray X amount or like, a, here's the minimum that you should be praying in order to be like a good husband, wife. And my, my response was, if you don't pray all day, but you acted correctly, like you were the best parent, you were affectionate, you gave of your time, you were charitable, you were loving, you were constructive, all these things. I said, that's prayer, but it's just action. And then the response is like, yes, but you also need prayer. I'm like, okay, true. You definitely also need prayer. So like, maybe there's just kind of two bounds to it. You have the this fictitious avatar that we've been criticizing this whole time the guy who just goes off and prays and expects God to manifest changes in his life without any work. And then you could probably have maybe the virtuous pagan sort of thing where like he's, it's a really good lot of natural virtue, but there's just no actual connection with the religion itself. Um, Tim, I'll start with you. You're not on the long. What's your take on like that, that balance between the two bounds? What's the golden mean? I mean, look, I one thing one thing we really tried to do with this book was be specific. This leave and cleave book, and and people now that we've made it through two lessons uh, on Wednesday nights are people are like, wow, you guys are being psychologically very specific. I'll I'll try to answer this question most specifically. Like, I don't know what other prayer. I'm not saying you can't do it, but aside from the five prayers that you should really hit every day. Um, it's, it's, it's less than a, a full rosary because you, you can't make your little kids do a full rosary. I try, the reason I miss a full rosary day is because we do a, a decade with the littler kids at night. We're about to bump it up to two decades with the other kids. Um, and then I try to finish those myself or with, with Steph, but, but that's bedtime prayer. 
you got to pray before all three meals, right? Which is just saying grace or whatever iteration of Thanksgiving you do before meals. That that should be non-negotiable. There's got to be some bedtime prayer and there's got to be some morning prayer. And so I, I would say that that should be the minimum. Anything else, there, there's no other precept in the church that tells us when it ends up being five times a day. So it sounds Muslim, but there's this more intense and there's this more strict. Um, and I wouldn't mind that. If there were five times a day, you absolutely, okay, we're doing the little office of the Virgin Mary. Everyone has to do this to be a Catholic, the way you have to go to Mass on Sunday. But there isn't. So I would say just, and rather than what, again, what trads will do and set the bar super high and say, this is the minimum, which is just kind of dumb to do. I'd say the real minimum is some sort of um, morning offering. You know, we do the morning offering at the beginning of our school day as a family because everyone's in there. We pray, you know, if every meal were together throughout the day, which is, you know, usually three times a day in the middle of the day, and then pray before prayer before bed, you know, one or two decades of the rosary before bed with the fam. And by the time they're all, they're all older, it'll be the full rosary they'll do with me. I would say that suffices because you're praying every couple of hours. I mean, you're praying every two and a half hours and you're praying the prayer that's specific to, okay, at the beginning of the day, bless all of the good things I do today. Um, bless all my meals because each one is a, a a grace of its own, a natural grace. Um, and um, and then prayer before bed is is probably most important. By the way, grace. I didn't know this till I looked. I would, I talked to Jay Dyer. Grace is not considered co-eternal with God. It's a, a relational creation creature that He made only for humans, which makes sense. But I, I got that wrong. I said that wrong on quite frankly show. Wait. Uh, Mike, how do you conceive, not, not just like this is the prayers that I have to pray, but how do you conceive of the balance itself of like, when do you feel internally that you're like, I'm a good dad, I'm a bad dad, I'm a good husband, I'm a bad husband with respect to sp spiritual expression and then like rubber meets the road patriarchy? Usually, I mean, the first thing for me is I start to feel convicted that I'm not praying enough with my family. That's like the little, you know, box in the back of my head. I know I need to tick every day. And I think I think Tim really laid it out well. I was going to say everything he was going to say, probably less eloquently, but it's the morning prayer. It's the prayers before meals and it's the prayer before bed. And those are for me are like the, the, cause again, at, at risk of sounding like you got to be on the team if you don't pray a rosary a day or whatever. And those evening prayers kind of shift around and they move around a little bit. I'll play with different things, full rosary, or, you know, I'll read some of the really beautiful prayers out of the deliverance book by Ripperger. Um, and then, you know, in addition, I think there's like the extracurricular prayers, like let's make this fun for the kids and have these little Jesus prayer books that they find entertaining. Um, and so uh, I noticed that, you know, let's say as a, as a husband, when things start to kind of feel a little cold between my wife and I, generally speaking, it's because I'm not, um, I'm not leading prayer with her and I enough. Hmm. So that's the kind of like a, a flare that goes up in, in, in the back of my head. And, you know, I usually feel like a pretty good dad most of the time. But when I feel like a bad dad is like, man, I wasn't as present during that evening prayer, or I'm not, or I didn't pray at all, which doesn't really happen that often. Um, so, I mean, not to say, well, I echo just everything what Tim said, but he pretty much, pretty much nailed it. And so when I'm not doing the grace before meals or I'm not doing the evening prayers, that's when that I really start to feel convicted to, Hey, I like, I'm kind of dropping the ball as a dad here. Like they don't care about how many toys they have or how big their house is. Like they care that I'm there and I'm present and I'm loving them. And we're sharing in the joy of the worship of the Lord. Hopefully that answers your question. Yeah. Will, what, what do you say to that? So oh, this is an area where I think we come back to the beginning of the conversation, which means that you can get this hyper focus on the prayer life of the family that actually isn't helpful. All of you have said, basically, do it with a kind of light touch. You might need to pray more sometimes than others, but trying to lay down the law about what every family must do. That's not helpful. And some guys with specific personalities can get really uh, anxious about it and it imposes extra strain on the family that's counterproductive. And whenever I have like an original thought, I always assume it's wrong. I think that's a really safe route to take. Like 
-hmm. mistrust originality. Look at what the church has taught. And you can go back to pre-Vatican II manuals. Listen to this. This is from Callan and McHugh. Uh, this is how little you can get away with praying if you're just thinking about what the duty is. Those who devoutly hear Mass at the times commanded comply with the duty of prayer, right? <laughs> now listen to this wow. again. Wow. Practical Catholics, that is those who comply with the precepts of the church, but who accuse themselves of neglecting morning and evening prayers or grace at meals, cannot be judged guilty of sin, even of venial sin, on account of this neglect. For there is no common precept directly obliging to such prayers. Now, this sends a lot of trads into a spiral, but mm -hmm. it's an exact example of how you're obsessing about one particular area of family life, which is important, sure. And there might be times when you're tempted in such a way that you need to pray pretty much continually, right? Maybe you're a husband who feels a strong temptation to adultery or something or to watch porn. I don't know. You better pray more, right, to help you get through that. And if you don't, that's your fault. But sometimes you might be better off just playing a puzzle or a game of catch with your kids than trying to impose yet another prayer into the family's already busy schedule. So take that for what it is. But if you really want to get specific about it, so much of this is left down to the individual patriarch in the household as a leader of that particular domestic church. And how much you might need to pray at one point in your family's life could be very different from another time. And you've got to have the skill to know how to adjust. I think there's going to be so much trad moralizing about what we're saying here because we're actually calling men to to a higher, to, to something higher than than prayer. And they I don't think they could conceive of such a thing. But Tim, you'll 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 knock this out of the park. What do you got to say? You just what Will said is so good, and you, you know, uh, having the manualist right there um, really helps. I would just say, I think this analogy really makes it clear. Whereas all everybody's afraid to talk about prayer as if it's it's not as necessary as let's say food. Well, let's make playing with your kid when you get home from work, playing with them and hugging them and just talking to them. Let's make that more like food and water needs. And let's leave prayer as what it is, prayer. Like people would all be comfortable if your kid were starving to death or had been, I don't know, heaven forbid, you know, underwater in a pool for a minute. And, you know, you have to get the water out and apply CPR and mouth to mouth. What do you need then? Do you need prayer? I mean, well, yeah, someone in the background can be playing, but you need to apply mouth to mouth. That's more like a kid that's been starved for your affection. What does he need right now? He needs air. Air is playing with him, like we'll say, go play catch with him and, and talk to him about how his day at school went, whether he's in grade school, middle school, high school, he needs it. Um, That's what he needs. He doesn't need prayer that everyone doesn't get down on one knee and pray before you apply mouth to mouth resuscitation. And that's what it is for a lot of these kids out there. A lot of them have trad dads that are just not being talked to and played with enough. Um, and their dad's like, well, I'm not, I'm still not going to do that, but let's go pray. It's like, dude, I'm, I'm suffocating. I mean, you, <laughs> these are precious seconds here. Send, send him into my study when he's ready to wear his first piece of tweed. <laughs> <laughs> so in the, in the, uh, last quarter mile of, of this episode, I think we can synthesize with, um, this main point. I won't spend too much time on two of these because we've sort of talked about it in the five misconceptions about patriarchy show, invisible lat syndrome, patriarchy, and billionaire patriarchy. But I just want to take a second to relate what we've been talking about with prayer to start, I think, something very close and similar to this is a dad who works too much. Um, you know, boomer parents who work too much and emphasize that their material provision is love. It's not that their material provision is affection. It is not. And so this overemphasis on prayer, I think, is quite synonymous where it's like, well, but I prayed with them every night. It's like, yeah, but did you ever tell them you loved them? Did you hug them? Did you mm -hmm. play catch with them? Did you show up to proud the piano them. recital? I'm proud of you. Too All of those things. Like you have to do that. That's something that Tim 
Tim does all the time. I, not the I'm proud of you, but the I love you. The amount of I love yous in the Gordon home is is like making up for like generations of of lack of I love yous. And it's it's just should be ubiquitous. Um so you have salaries not gonna translate no matter how hard you work in the office. And the other is is your body. Um right before we started recording, we were sort of comparing like bricklayers and blue collar workers, like going to the gym might make a more aesthetically pleasing body, like symmetrically, you know, proportionally, you might, you might have the V taper, uh, if you spend time in the gym, but the guy, the blue collar worker, who's, you know, hauling hay bales or laying bricks or working at the steel mill, that's eight to 14 hours of uninterrupted stressful labor that will put fat deposits in your love handles and put hair on your upper back and like make your toes ugly or something like you're not going to be a pretty man by doing grueling labor uh and that also <laughs> doesn't mean you're not uh, won't de should not decrease the leadership or the respect that you garner in your home. Like you don't have to be a pretty man in order to garner this respect. You don't have to preen in order to garner the respect. So the sort of emphasis on like, well, I have a six pack. Well, I can I can bench this much weight. Like, why doesn't my my why the why doesn't my wife respect me? Why don't my kids respect me? I'm super strong. I'm super lean. And that gets into I think the final point that I'm very curious to hear all of your points on it's like it's aura over everything you can't lift or pray or earn your egregious personality defects away like you ha you have to be like a cool guy and this isn't just like four cool guys being like you're not cool and you need to be cool like us we're just saying like if you're not right or if you're if it's not working you're not right about something and if you have a six pack and if you make 500K a year, and if you pray a rosary or the, the whole office and your wife and your kids don't respect you, something's wrong. Tim, what do you, what do you say about that? I'd say that's just good anthropology, what you just said. I also know, you know some trads will be mad about the comparison, um, the, the, I think accurate comparison between the, the paycheck and praying, pay, getting paid and getting prayed. Uh, you know, it's not sufficient for, for acts of love. And I just think that good anthropology is always, um, applying Aristotle's function argument to, to men. And that's, that's, uh, what your last statement was. Yeah. If, if you're, I mean, like I, I have this little five item checklist as my entire introduction for, for this book. And it's like, look, if your teenagers don't respect you, it's because you're doing something wrong. It's either maybe you need to lift a few more weights. Maybe it's you're lifting weights too much. Maybe you need to pray more. Maybe you're praying too much. To I mean, not that if you do it in the wee hours of the night, they'll disrespect that. But maybe you're doing it in lieu of other things. I just think that that guys should should take that to heart, what, what you just said, Nick, that if you're acting right, you will get right results from the other members of your household. And if you're not, this is something we, we do end up saying at least once per Wednesday night class. If you're not, then it, it it's there's no mysteries here. There's no like mm -hmm. medical mysteries. You are doing something wrong. And I would just mm -hmm. I would I would just leave last comment by um, adding to the moralist that will read about about prayer specifically because i know what a hang up this is um think about think about the quiet man that everyone respects everyone's like well he just doesn't want to yammer on you know he doesn't some days he just doesn't have much to say apply that to prayer i think i've said that on this show before it's like some guys are just less loquacious and um that no one thinks that that makes them less virtuous if they if they act virtuously the rest of the time uh, a mean guy that never talks he's just he's a, he's a jerk no one likes him but that's how it is with prayer too some guys are just more loquacious with god that that um accounts for a lot of the natural variants a lot of and i think it's uh, the the shoes on the other foot with guys that like to pray a lot because if you take a holy guy that's naturally extroverted 
he's less oriented toward praying. If you take a holy guy that's introverted, he'll probably get out a lot of his chattiness with the Lord. That doesn't make him more holy. It's the same excuse, I guess, the the extroverted guy who prays less would give to God that the introverted guy gives to the rest of the world. Like, look, sometimes I can, I can just be there and listen and, and grateful and all these things without without speaking. Right. There, there's, I think, going to be, I hope this episode gets listened to by the trads. I really do. And I'm saying that like we're not traditional Catholics, but like by, by the trad world at large, because I think there's going to be a very feminine approach to what we're saying about principles, and they're going to f- try and find um, the the exceptions and make that the rule. Like, no nobody on this panel is saying that sloth and a fat body, a slovenly body, um, is okay. Nobody's saying that like, no prayer is okay or like just doing the you know bare basics you can be it's none of what we're saying here but like mike when you and karen got together you were less strong you had less earning capacity and you had uh less holiness you weren't catholic you know you were still finding your way out of out of some rough parts of your life some vices and you guys we're magnetized to each other. So clearly <laughs> it's not because of the man you are today. It was because of your, your character. It was because of your personality. It was because of your charm. It was because of your perspective about the world. Is that what you noticed um, as being the attractive factor with, with your wife? Uh, yeah, uh, for, for sure. Um, it's kind of wild to think about how far you know, we've come. Um, and, you know, to answer that original point too, um, I think oftentimes it's, it's just a matter of putting second things first and first things second, which usually causes disorder. You know, it's like, if you're going to build a house, are you going to put the top of the house at the foundation, the foundation on top of it? So it's not really going to make much sense. Right. It's like you being this giant and I, and I, cause I've tried to do it is what I'm trying to say is, um, I've tried to make up for a lack of being present and loving and joyful in the home with earning capacity or the fact that, did you know your dad can deadlift 800 pounds? It's like, nobody cares, bro. Nobody cares. Uh, those uh, those secondary things build on the primary things. And so if you're primarily you know, a good and present, loving and joyful husband and father, um, but you're out of shape and you don't pray very much, well, it's going to make you a better husband and father in all of those areas if you've got that first thing taken care of. Um, but you can't get those things out of order. And I just think typically that's where guys get them out of order. I, I did that with the physical, the financial. It's like to my wife, well, you see, you see how built I am compared to most guys. You see how much more money I make. It's like, yeah, but you're not here. You're not, it's the same thing for <laughs> prayer. It's like answering the question, what, what makes a, you know, a good Catholic? Well, we've got days of obligation. Um, we should probably try to stay in a state of grace as much as we can and partake in the sacraments beyond that at, you don't need to pray out that those moral manuals is so good. The pre-Vatican II manual that you just quoted, it's so good because it kind of just deduces it down to its most simple component. Just be a present and loving husband and father. Don't neglect your health. Don't neglect your prayer life because those secondary things build on the primary things. Right. It's, it, it, yeah. It's simple. It's it's simple, harder in execution, but simple when you're, you know, speaking it out loud. And when, when we say put first things first, of course, that means that you put God first in your life. But the point is that God wants you to work on the natural virtues. Like if you're a farmer thinking about preparing the soil so that it can actually receive the the crop, the water, the sunshine, all the rest of it, that's kind of like how grace operates in your life. And God wants you to work alongside him. He's not going to do it all for you. And on the point about physical fitness and basic hygiene and diet, all the rest of it, we're not saying it doesn't matter. Like it, it helps you to take yourself seriously if you can see your own penis, right? That Stuff like that matters. It affects how you carry yourself as a man, how your wife interacts with you. So you can't be one of those guys who thinks that stuff doesn't matter. We're not saying that. But you can't go to the other extreme and think that because you earn X and have body fat level Y, that automatically means that your wife needs to bow down to you. I've had a really sad DM from a lady whose husband is like that. He walks around the house saying, I am the 1% man. 
Like, look at my income. Look at what I can lift. I am the 1%. You should be so grateful that you're with me. And he's going to have a conversation with her, right? She's like an, an add-on to his life. And she's starting to feel the disconnection creeping in. I know where it's going, right? This is how things, if they go day by day, end up in separation, divorce if they're not Catholic. And guys just turn a blind eye to it because they're focusing on the wrong stuff. So I, I'd I'd like to get your guys' takes on, maybe we could just outline four uh, personality defects that aren't something that you can pray for. It's something you have to work for, something you have to be honest about in yourself. I'll just speak about my own because it's the one that I'm currently fighting tooth and nail with. And that, and that's just basic discipline. If you, if you can make a commitment, I'm going to do X and you, they're not doing it. I think that any guy who's tried to break a habit or form a new habit, um, has probably gone through or tried to break an addiction, um, has gone through this, this sort of mental cycle of the, the feeling of self-loathing when you know, you can't trust yourself. You said, I'm going to do this and then you don't do it. And that, that internal rift comes out everywhere else. You'll either overcorrect and accuse other people of not living up to certain standards because you feel shame, right? So you're going to project that outward. Or you walk around just with complete self-loathing, like, you know, how coomers feel because you know, you know, inside you, you, you're not a man, you're not internally consistent. So I, mine would be discipline. Um, pick something it, I don't care. It literally doesn't matter what it is. Something constructive and do it every single day and don't stop doing it and never stop doing it if you know that it's good. Um, free for all. Who, who's, who's got another character defect that just needs to be rooted out through natural virtue? I so think that, I uh, I got to... Go sorry, Mike. Will. Go ahead, man. No, no you go, man. Go, go I appreciate it. Yeah, I got to hop off in a few minutes, but I wanted to just cap off my point here. Um, for me, it's it's a couple of things. Um I'm too rigidly disciplined and I'm an anxious asshole. So what I mean by that is, <laughs> is that <clears throat> when there's a little change in the schedule or what have you, it could be anything, eating schedule, working schedule. I don't know how to deal with that because everything's so segmented and concrete every aspect of my day because that's the only way I know how to live. There's some semblance of control. So letting go of that and being a little bit more spontaneous is something I have to go to battle with as you know, one of the first things. And what I mean by anxious asshole is when my anxiety, when my hypochondria, uh, I know Tim relates to this big time, when that acts up, um, it is almost impossible for me to be present. I'm just, I'm just buzzing all over the place. I'm just in my own head. It's hard for me to know where my feet are firmly planted. So again, another thorn. And then an asshole, meaning like I'm just, I'm choleric. I don't, a lot of times I have a struggle with having these conversations um, you know, with my wife that require a bit more of that higher EQ for me to sit down and be patient and not so dismissive and to meet her where she's at and to guide us out of, you know, certain emotional situations or squabbles or what have you. So I would say like, those are the three primary character defects, character traits. I would, I would say that I'm constantly going to battle with, and there's been improvements. Like God gives me the grace to overcome them. And, you know, they're, they're not impossible to overcome, but I would say those are most definitely those those three things for me. Yeah, so just to abstract that out um, a little bit, Mike, from the specifics, uh, it sounds like all, in all three ways, making uh, the home environment uncomfortable or tense for those around you. I could imagine that that would detract from respect or leadership if everybody feels like they're caught on an inhale then that's going to be hard to sure. respect a patriarch. Yeah, absolutely. Cause they're either like, you know, anxious or paralyzed with not fear, but like, what's dad thinking? How is he feeling? Everybody's kind of like walking on eggshells um, or like, where is dad? He's right here, but where is he? You know? So how yeah. do you like, how do you re fully respect and want to love on a man when he's, you know, physically present, but completely spiritually, mentally absent or, you know, tense and kind of, you can feel this heat just emanating off me like a big block motor, just like idling senselessly at a red light. You know what I'm saying? Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> if you're not a car guy, maybe not, but <laughs> high idle, I'm a... burning a lot of fuel, <laughs> getting hot. <laughs> yeah. 
I think quite a lot of this is genetic as well. And you can look to your own parents to learn some of your own dispositions that you need to watch out for. Like when I was a kid, uh, my dad lost his job and I didn't even know, right? Until years later, because he didn't talk about it. You wouldn't guess from watching him. And kind of like Mike was just saying, like the, the idling motor, he was just a bit quieter than normal and maybe just focus on the next thing that he had to do to get it done to provide. And that can emanate a particular kind of energy in the home. I have that same trait too. And you got to remember that most communication is completely nonverbal and nonvocal. Like after you get the physical communication in, then it gets into verbal, like tone of voice, volume, speed, cadence. Only then does the actual words you use come in so that the mm. words you say are the smallest way in which you communicate with your family. And yet we think because words are the thing that we have that makes us so obviously different from other animals. It's a sign of our rationality. We think it's mainly about words, but it's not. So I have to remind myself of that the whole time. But what's, what's, um, that's all good and, and useful, but what's a defect, a personality defect that you've encountered with coaching that guys are trying to pray away that you think they just need to grit their teeth and stop or start doing? The most common one is probably to do with effeminacy, right? Which is letting things that are pleasurable in the moment or that come easily to you, distract you from doing the more important hard stuff that you'd rather not do in the moment. I think that's so common. The other one, and the one I suffer from more myself, it's another aspect of temperance, is um, like pride. So tempering your confidence in yourself about how much you can do without God's help. We talked a lot today about mm. how much you do need to put in, put in your utmost. Like I tend to think that my utmost is actually more than it really is and can account for more. I don't ask for God's help soon enough. I'll go to the other extreme. Yeah. Yeah, me too. Uh, that's one. It sounds like you're asking Nick for ex the expression of um, virtues needed in sort of both ourselves and then in coaching um, it, in our interactions with the world, particularly in the masculinity sphere. I, I also struggle with that one, thinking that um, when things are normal, you know, and just having a bit of pride, thinking that my utmost is probably more than it is. You, you need the grace of God every day. And that's why I, in some sense I do better <clears throat> when I'm debilitated, you know, like St. Paul says, great when you're small. Um, I also struggle out of pride, a kind of pride, because I knew I have, I know I have a lot of projects I'm working on every day with, with corner cutting. Some of that's just working smart. Some of it's just old fashioned laziness. I've talked about that before here. Um, so that kind of discipline, I know everyone's nodding their head, the guy that came in a half hour late, like, yeah, say discipline. <laughs> uh, no, normally, I, I kind of, uh, the corner cutting is I'm I'm kind of, uh, you know, a minute late into everything, and I fit a bunch of stuff into th this morning. I just missed my alarm. So sorry, everyone. I sincerely apologize. The main one that I see in guys that I that I coach, and so it's a kind of, it's a kind, there's a courage involved in, in the, um, you know, development and allocation of new virtues anytime. Um, I also need to, I, I'm, whereas I'm plenty courageous in most situations, um, Mike and I talk about this. I always need more courage when the hypochondria is acting up. You no, know, like real courage to kind of just, just be courageous. Well, where do I get it from? All of a sudden I sound like these guys I'm about to um, critique. But the main one that household men need in ordinary day-to-day -day situations is just courage of confrontation, just lead. And they're like, well, Okay, but I i mean, it, it, it's happened. I've had three conversations with dudes this week where they're like, well, I'm just, I'm going to pray more. One guy was like, should I should I take your class? And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, okay, well, um, I don't know. Actually, I had this conversation with two guys. Oh, should I make my wife take it? Yeah, it's, it's kind of for the couple. Well, how do I make her take it? I'm like, okay, you definitely need this course. Um, yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's yeah, what like, I'm saying, like why I'm, I'm, anthropologically i'm interested in your anthropological take on this is you seem to be the guy most trying to like pull both sides together of like just be a cool guy and then like also here's traditional catholicism of 
there's something that that person's missing when they're like, what do you mean? How do I, like, how do I lead? Like, how do I make it happen? It's like, well, damn. Okay. We got a lot of work to do here. <laughs> yeah. Cause it's like, I don't know. I would just say something like, look, tr you need to be in there, but you're going to like it. Trust me. I mean, there is the, <laughs> the two sides of it where it's not like, just get on the course. You know, no one, <laughs> no one wants to do that. But, and I, I don't do that, but it's like, just, just trust me. I, I'm not going to talk about this anymore. It's something we're going to do together, but I, I promise you it'll be really, really good. Trust me. Trust me. That's, that's your job. Trust me. Yeah. Uh, we're going to do it together. Yeah. Before you came on, I, I was talking to, uh, I think it was before we hit record, but I was sharing this really hilarious Mike Tyson quote with Mike and Nick and a reporter asked him if he intimidated people before the fight, you know, that rumor about how he broke people psychologically with the stare down, whatever. And he said, what are you talking about? That's nonsense. I intimidate people by hitting them. And that's <laughs> basically the same thing. Like, how do I get her to take the course? What? You yeah, hit us, exercise oh, 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 no, authority. No, no, no. Okay. No, they're, they're, they're not Muslim. This, is, this isn't Islam. Um, you, you just exercise authority and say you're taking the course. And right. I, that's how you get it done. Right. Yeah it's, yeah. it's 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 the same thing as how do I begin to be courageous? Do an act of courage. How do I begin to be a leader? Do an act of leadership. And but but will the guys you you know better than anyone? You and Mike know better than me. I just do it through email or text when people aren't, well, oh, should I take this course? Like you guys confront it every day. They're like, well, but how do you lead? You're like, you want me to literally get your phone and do the text for you? You just, They're like, well, should I yell or like bang things? I'm, I've literally had guys ask that. I'm like, no, <laughs> where, where did you get this? This is like an SNL skit. Like, no, of course that's not leading. Who told, okay, the feminists always accuse masculinists and and patriarchs of just leading through tyranny and i'm like that's tyranny that's disordered leadership why would you think that now i know because a bunch of the guys out there are like well should i like yell and bang things and start punching people it's like no that's not leadership leadership take control of the situation and i guess they just don't know what that entails yeah they got like a little megaphone and a tiny step that they get up <laughs> on which has the word yeah. patriarch written on it and they turn the megaphone up extra loud and they're like, right. okay, time to listen. Um, right. I had a good situation with a, a guy whose wife was threatening separation if he moved the kids to the school that he wanted them to be in because he thought it was better for their spiritual welfare. It involved a house move to. She didn't want this. She's super anxious about it. So she was threatening separation about it. And in the end, long talk, but the guy was like, I have to hold the line on this. We're going to make the move. And I'm going to call a bluff on it. And he didn't shout. He didn't make a fuss. He just calmly said, this is happening. Like, it's going to be okay. Whatever fears you've got, don't worry about it. Went through with it. No problems. Like, that's how you do it. Right. The problem yeah. with so many of these marriages, and that's such a good example, is that these women know exactly how to use the gas and brake pedals of feminism, the gas right. pedal of man up and the brake pedal of toxic masculinity. And so these guys have been like gaslit into thinking that they're, their their leadership and then exercising their authority is 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 exactly that it's you know either two of those things but they're being manipulated like a puppet on a string when it's just literally a matter of calmly and tactfully we're going through with this and you can either come and join me and trust me or you're going to come kicking and screaming either way this is what we're going to do and then just existing in that tension I was like yeah, you might, might piss your wife off that's okay but she's going to respect you more for it Right. Steph always says all women, not these women. You're always right. She's she's mouthing stuff to me behind. She's like, all women know how to use the gas and the brake pedal of feminism, even good women on a bad day. She says, always call the bluff of women. <laughs> she's mouthing yep. it to me over here. She's like, always. Call the bluff. <laughs> and it's yeah, true. Days. Yeah. Ripperger, Ripperger told me two anecdotes that I, I won't repeat, but when I when I interviewed him, he was kind enough to drop me off at the airport. And he told me two stories similar to that of like, this is what happens when you listen to your wife, like Adam listened to Eve and ate the apple. And this is what happens when you don't listen to your wife and you do what you know is good for for her and for the family. And the, the stories proceeded as you could expect, happy and sad endings, respectively, um, or sad and happy endings, respectively. Yeah. So there's there's going to be different groups of guys here. There's guy like Tim writes books. Mike and Will, you guys do coaching. Mike and Will, you guys have groups. Tim, you have uh, a, a the mayor, um, 
the marriage course, Leave and Cleave, One Flesh, uh, going on right now. And you're not doing it because you think it's that there aren't people who need it. Clearly, you're doing it because there are people who need it. So we're not repudiating like guidance. Like there's a there's a foundational level of education that like I'm still going through learning from you three and just in general. And there's a lot of guys who do need to be told the fundamentals. So like if you if you're a guy who needs those fundamentals, like seek out those resources and Tim Will and Mike. <clears throat> but then there's a set of guys who uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I think they've quote unquote tried everything and they aren't seeing results. And they're putting the supernatural over the natural out of effeminacy. And that's what this episode is about. It's that you, there's things that you have to do naturally that you cannot skirt around. And until you're right about those, your house isn't going to be in order. Um, so I hope the trads listen to this and, um, you know, maybe, I don't know, maybe it'll turn into, I really do feel like this, debate about prayer and respectability and the, the emphasis on spirituality um, could be a really interesting point of, of debate in sort of the, the online Catholic world. And I, and I really feel like we brought um, a perspective to this that is genuinely calling guys to something higher. Right. Um, instead of supplanting it with, you just need to, to pray more like, no, you need to be a good man. And yeah, and that, that requires effort. It's like C.S. Lewis's comment that things are so bad now that before we can become good Christians, we have to become good pagans. That's what the emphasis is. And in your household, if there's something that like a Viking would think was cringe and gay, fix that and then worry about all the extra stuff to do with Christianity, because that's probably where your biggest weakness is. Like your tone of voice when you talk to your wife, that might be the thing. So the Viking test, that's the homework for everyone for CMAS this week. Do the Viking test. What is it in your household that is probably hidden there, right under your nose that you've missed because you're so focused on the spiritual realm? Yeah. Mike uh, right Viking, there. A Viking's definitely going to think all of our beardlessness is cringe and gay. Well, <laughs> well they, 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 they were pretty tolerant of sodomy. So uh, take that, Vikings. <laughs> <laughs> <Lear or sodomy>. <laughs> <laughs> all right guys good show see you Thank next time job, god bless <laughs>